So the nucleus is in the center of the atom, but the nuclei, which is plural for nucleus, of multiple atoms don't normally interact. If you ever get to the point where nucleus interact, then we're talking about nuclear chemistry. We're talking about extremely high energy, atomic bomb type energy, literally. What we see on an everyday basis, the chemical interactions of anything are based upon the electron and what they are doing. The electrons being lost or gained, we already talked about that. That is the creation of ions, but there's also electrons being shared as well. And when we get into more talking about bonding, then we'll talk a little bit more about the sharing of those. So the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model, they explain something about the periodic trends that we talked a little bit about that Mendeleev helped create when he organized the periodic table. We said the noble gases are nobility, right? They don't like to mess around with anybody, any other uh, elements. There's a reason why, and it has to do with the electrons. These right here like to give up electrons. They are highly reactive. There's a reason why, and it has to do with the electrons, something called the octet rule. So Niels Bohr left and Schrodinger both kind of came up with two different ideas about the electron and what was it and is it a wave, is it a particle. If you're ever bored and are into stuff like this, it's a very nerdy talk, but if you look up on YouTube, uh, Richard Feynman, who is like big time quantum physicist, he's, I think he's dead now, but he did a talk over wave particle duality that's like extremely famous. And he talks about um, shooting a gun and, and it's, it's pretty interesting, but it's, it's kind of out there. It, so I'm gonna try my best to kind of make it sensible. So light is an electromagnetic radiation, the same way that we, there's plenty of other electromagnetic radiation that we don't associate with light, such as x-rays, you go to the doctor, such as infrared, if you've ever seen like uh, any of the movies where people have night vision goggles, right? The electromagnetic energy that the night vision goggles are sensing is not the color that you see on the, on the little screen, right? It shows you red and orange color. It's actually the heat emitting from the person which is also a different form of electromagnetic radiation. The wavelength says something about the energy, and it also says something about our ability to see it. We can only see visible light. There are plenty of animals that can see infrared, right? Especially ones that move around in the dark. The, 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 it's just a teeny chunk of light that's actually visible for us, and that's Roy G. Bibb. We know that uh, the colors of the rainbow. Um, this number here is constant speed. That is the C in E equals MC squared. And light has properties of both waves and particles. We can watch it behave like both. Uh, this is to try to give you an idea of what wave behavior looks like if you drop water, the wave is going to carry energy outward as it moves through the water. Unlike light, you know, the waves on the water will eventually disappear, but light waves, you know, they don't go away. Here is something we should all kind of remember from our physical science days, it is the wavelength is from crest to crest, that is a distance usually denoted by this lowercase Greek symbol lambda. The trough is essentially the crest, but on the underside, if you will. And then the direction of travel, or the direction that the wave is propagating, uh, is they're listing it as to the right in this particular. But, you know, we have ways of directing light, lasers, things like that. 
So the white light that we see by these light bulbs or by the sun is a combination of a lot of different wavelengths of light that come together to form white. We see these colors if you pass it through a prism or if, you know, a rainbow is actually the light being passed through moisture in the air, which helps split the wavelengths from one another. Red light has the longest wavelength of visible light. It's also the lowest in energy because wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. Violet light, almost ultraviolet, which is right outside of the violet visible range, has the shortest wavelength and is also the highest energy. So, you know, if you want to feel or be more energetic, right, wear violet. The presence of the color in the white light is responsible for what we see in our everyday vision. Notice nanometers. Here we, here we end back to our uh, making sure we know our prefixes and can convert from meters to nanometers and back. And we'll be doing some math with the, with the wavelength. So here is your white light, red and violet. The light would be separated in the prism, and it has to do with the difference in wavelength. Light speed is always the same. This, you cannot change the speed regardless of what you send it through. Even if you send it through water, air, a vacuum, speed of light is always going to be the same. If anybody's ever watched some of the uh, Cosmos stuff, they talk about the speed of light. It's actually pretty interesting. What is different is that the wavelengths are larger or smaller and that's what allows you to actually uh, split it in and see the different colors and the order that they're in has to do with how they or how their wavelengths are organized. A red shirt appears red because it reflects red light. It absorbs all of the other colors of light except red. Our eyes only see the reflected light, making the shirt appear red. Now, that's if white light is what is being shined down onto whatever you're looking at. But if you've ever seen like a, a, a dark light, or I'm, I'm, the name is, yeah, a black light, excuse me, a black light, things look different colors, right? They, they don't look the color that we know that they are because we're so ingrained and used to white light being absorbed that when you have a black light, it's a little bit different. So our frequency, new, lowercase Greek letter as well, is defined as the number of cycles or crests that pass through a stationary point in a second. Wavelength and frequency are inversely related. The equation looks like E equals M. E equals H nu or E equals HC over lambda. And the reason why lambda and nu are inversely proportional is because of this. Nu is C over lambda. And they're related. And we'll do some practice problems with those. We call light in its particulate form, a photon, but again, it has wave and particle. This is the particle side of things. We can think of a photon as a single packet of light energy. The amount of energy in the packet depends on the wavelength of the light. Like I said, shorter wavelength, more energy, longer wavelength, lower energy. And light waves carry more energy if their crests are closer together, meaning higher frequency and shorter wavelength. Violet light, violet light carries more energy per photon than red light. Constant speed, electromagnetic radiation, can exhibit wave or particle properties. The wavelength determines the amount of energy. The shorter, again, the greater the energy. That's something you're going to definitely have to know. The frequency and energy are inversely related to its wavelength. 
So E in this equation, energy is equal to Planck's constant, which the, I think they may talk about here shortly, times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Clearly, the smaller wavelength ends up making that number larger. Okay, here's a good picture. So, if you look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, this little teeny chunk is the visible light that we can see. And it exists between the ultraviolet, UV, a little bit past violet, and infrared, which we know is heat, it's heat waves. The numbers that you see uh, are the wavelength in meters. Notice that visible light is in the nanometer from 750 to 400. Everything else, we got radio waves. So yes, radio in your car is electromagnetic waves. Microwaves, we know, from heating up food. Infrared radiation is, uh, like I said, heat. X-rays can go through things. And then gamma rays, which are very high energy, are extremely dangerous and generally are not used uh, very often for regular practical purposes. Right. Making the hope. Gamma rays produced by the sun, stars, certain unstable atomic nucleus, excessive exposure is dangerous because they can damage biological molecules. They can actually go and, and damage cells, which is pretty crazy. X-rays we know, medical use, they pass through substances that block visible light used to image internal bones and organs. X-rays carry enough energy to damage molecules as well. That's one of the reasons why whatever they're not looking at, you wear those vests, because that blocks the X-rays, especially in a, with the dentist chair. They give you that heavy stuff. Excessive exposure can increase cancer risk. But generally, you only get maybe one or two x-rays a year. It's not, it's not a big deal. UV is the component of sunlight that produces sunburn or a tan. While not as energetic, UV still carry enough to damage, right? We, we've seen skin cancer come up from too much UV exposure. Um, cataracts, which is eye issues. I actually didn't know that. Exposure to UV, wear your sunglasses and cause premature wrinkling of the skin, which we've seen from people who spend too much time on the beach. Visible light, we know about. So the photons, we, our eye intakes them. It hits the back of our eye, and then it sends a signal to our brain that we associate with color. Here's a very interesting point. What is the color that is most sensitive to human vision of the electromagnetic spectrum. Anybody know? Green. Mm -hmm. It's green. It is green. Red, people actually have red issues with seeing red, right? Some people are red, green colorblind, or red, blue colorblind. Green is actually the most sensitive. Does anybody know why? Because of the plants. Because of the plants? Well, it, it, it does have to do with the plants, but it has to do with survival. Green is the most sensitive because in the development of humans to look out for predators in a jungle type situation scenario you had to be able to differentiate things that were hiding correct or to find things that you were hunting for you need to be able to differentiate and if the plants and the foliage where you were at were green which they mostly are if you've seen a rainforest then green needs to be the most sensitive color and that's the proposed reason why? With a bunch of scientific data to back that up. Infrared, heat, when you place your hand near a hot object, that's infrared light. So it's technically light, but you can't see it. So, you know, using the term light is very interesting. So if you put your hand close to the stove, infrared. All warm objects, including human bodies, emit infrared light. While it is invisible to our eyes, infrared sensors can detect it and are used in night vision. So the light bulb, it'll give you visible and infrared light. It's actually more effective as heating than, than light. That's why we try to get better technology. So here's your normal photograph, visible light, here's your infrared. 
dark blue is going to be cold and red is going to be hot. Do you said for like ghost hunters and stuff? Hmm? Like ghost, ghost hunters? Yeah, like ah. ghost hunters. <laughs> I don't know. I, I've seen these TV shows. Is anybody, I mean, I'm not necessarily completely against the theory of some spirits and ghosts. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know if I would pay for a hunter of a ghost, but I would go along with them. <laughs> for black lights, how do they reflect off? You know, the little—that's a good question. I think a black light is ultraviolet. It's in the ultraviolet range. Why does it reflect? I think because the, there's a little bit of it that's in the visible spectrum. And it's probably only violet color. And because it's only violet, I feel like that's probably what affects your vision. But that's a good question. I need to actually look that up as to why things kind of look white. Yeah, it's because of like, you know, whenever you put black light on yeah. it, just slows. You're right, right. And you can see, see a lot of different things more you know more prominent right black lives show you how much lint is on your clothes beyond infrared you got microwaves we know used for radar and for heating things the reason that microwaves actually work is because of water if you put something that is extremely dry in a microwave it's going to take a long time to heat up if you've ever had someone in your family, your mom or your grandma say, you know, just sprinkle some water on something and help it heat it up, it's because microwaves actually make water dance, if you will. It makes the bonds, when, we're, when we get to talking about the bond, it makes the bonds of water move and vibrate, and that vibration, law of conservation of energy, it has to go somewhere, it actually goes into heating up the food. So if you put something with a lot, with not, not a lot of water in it, it's going to take a while to heat up. And then radio waves, we know for AM and FM radio, cell phones, TV, and communication. Can carry enough information for that, and they're extremely long, right? You can go radio across the country. So this is kind of, uh, you know, arrange these based on wavelength. Well, we know visual light should be nanometers, x-ray, a little bit more powerful, and microwaves, a little bit less powerful. So wavelength should go from x-ray, visible, to microwave, increasing. And I don't know, do they give us the answers? No. So frequency is the inverse of wavelength, so that would be backwards. You would just turn that around. It would go microwaves, x-ray, I mean microwave visible light, then x-ray. And the energy per photon, x-ray should have the highest energy. Yeah. Microwaves should have the lowest. Um, radiation treatment for cancer, x-rays and gamma rays. Uh, This is pretty interesting. Um, the X and gamma rays, we beam at the tumors. The radiation damages the tumor, which is what we want it to do. And then the cell, tumor cell, stops producing more cells. And obviously, healthy cells sustain damage. You know, uh, any kind of radiation is going to get anything in that area is also going to be uh, messed up. So we try to minimize exposure by shielding, and then they've gotten really good with the technology that they can kind of pinpoint like needle-like precision on where these beams are heading. So each element can emit light. So bringing this back to chemistry, you know, this is, that's been a, a, a fairly physics-based talk up to this point. Neon lights. We know about neon lights. We know that they show red. They determine whether something is open or not. That sign. Whoever made and came up with that sign, you know, they, they've made like a billions of dollars, right? That same open sign at the gas station. You would think it's probably one or two companies that make those. So if an element absorbs a certain amount of energy, 
law of conservation energy, it says it has to go somewhere. So what ends up happening, we actually end up getting movement of these electrons and these movement of electrons can, can end up in visible light. Not always, but can. So here's some uh, hydrogen lamp and a mercury lamp and we have some of these, but I, I'm not so familiar with playing around with them. But as you can see, the light emitted from mercury is blue. The light emitted from hydrogen is this pinkish color. Why are there different colors? Well, we know different colors correspond to different wavelengths. Different wavelengths correspond to different energies. So that means the energy that is being absorbed and emitted is going to be different for each different element. So here is what a white light spectrum looks like. Roy G. Bill. We got everything. Together, it's going to look white. Hydrogen has only got three lines, and some of you all probably can't see this. Helium has got more lines, and neon has got a bunch of different lines that can be emitted. Now, this should make sense that why neon has more lines than hydrogen. Anybody know? The number of electrons? Right, more electrons. Hydrogen only has one. Helium has two, and then neon has ten. That changes where the electrons can move around to, effectively. All right. The results to these emission spectrum experiments that were going on, uh, Niels Bohr came up with it. He said that there's this planetary type model. You know, up until this point, we said that electrons are around the nucleus. We don't really know where they are because we can't pinpoint them. But at the time, Bohr said, no, I think that these different energy levels are quantized or we can quantify them as levels one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. The N stands for that level, and he essentially said that there are kind of like rings, and each of these rings, as you get further out, get larger, and more electrons can be housed there, and he called them orbits. We build, and, and essentially we built the atom this way, kind of like a ladder. This number is a specific distance from the nucleus and at e is each at a specific energy. Essentially he was saying that if the electron moves between let's say N1 and N2, we should expect a certain light spectrum on that uh, emission spectrum. If it goes from three to one, we should expect something different, so on and so forth. One of the main issues that Bohr, that all the scientists have with Bohr is that a, the electron couldn't be in between any of these. It had to be at one of these particular energy levels. And it was too constrained. Some of the scientists didn't, didn't completely agree with that. So here is the process of excitation and emission. If an atom absorbs energy, the electrons are what absorbs the energy. You can excite an electron to a higher energy level. Once it is excited, the electron realizes that it doesn't really enjoy being at that excited level for too long, and it will release the energy. So absorption of energy is excitation. That's like, kind of like an electron turn up, and then the electron must turn down. As it turns down, it releases the light emission. But notice that all of the energy that is absorbed may not be all of the energy released as light. It can be released vibrationally. It can be released as heat energy. What I'm saying that to say, if you put in a certain amount of energy to the electron, that does not mean you get that exact same amount out. But the law of conservation of energy says that the exact same amount of energy must be lost somehow. And some of that is, is lost in a numerous different ways. If you get to later on down the line in um, physical chemistry, if you take some advanced stuff, they talk about different types of uh, relaxation of electrons. It's actually really interesting. The energy absorbed can be electrical in nature, right? Plugging in the neon lamp is 
you plug it in the wall. And then this process happens billions and billions of times. We don't see any gaps in the sign because now the sign is shining, but it's this process that's happening. You can, obviously, through experimentation, you can find out which, what level of excitation energy you need to get to a particular orbit level. You put more in, you can excite it further out, correct? So here they're showing it going from one to looks like four, and then coming back down. energy in this photon, and we're calling this packet of light, this electron, this energy, a photon, it has a specific wavelength because the energy is related to the wavelength based on this equation. The light emitted by the atoms consists of specific lines, specific wavelength, each corresponding to a transition between two orbits, which is what I just said. For example, the 486 nanometer line in the hydrogen emission spectrum corresponds to a drop from N4 to N equals 2. In the same way, the line is 657 nanometers, a longer wavelength, and lower energy corresponds to a relaxation from 3 to 2. Should make sense. This relaxation, two energy levels, has a higher energy, shorter wavelength, than the relaxation of 1, because it took more energy to promote the electron up to the higher energy level. So a shorter energy difference is going to end up with a lower energy spectrum. And here's kind of what, what that looks like. Now, hydrogen only has one electron. So that one electron has to exist at the lowest energy level. It starts off at n equals 1. It doesn't start off any higher than that. And we'll talk in a second about how we build up uh, the electronic structure. So it was cool for hydrogen. Other scientists didn't like it so much because we started looking at other elements, other spectrum, and it didn't explain what was happening. So. Quantum mechanics pops up. And the quantum mechanics is beyond the scope of this class. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for even myself to completely wrap my head around the idea of quantum mechanics. But we went away from the orbits of these stationary set energy pathways to probability density, essentially saying the electron can exist anywhere from here to here, but we can't say exactly where. And that was Heisenberg. That's where Heisenberg came up with the uncertainty principle. That was one of the main things. We just don't know where they are exactly. But we know that they have to be 99% confident that they're within this amount of volume and space. And, you know, for those that are interested, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube that's beyond, you know, beyond my level of uh, expertise. But they're showing, they're trying to compare a baseball to an electron. So the pitcher throws the baseball. If we track it being thrown, it looks like that. In quantum mechanics, the catcher would not know, could not know exactly where the electron would cross the plate. He would have no way of predicting that and catching it. However, if he kept up track with hundreds of electron throws, he could observe a reproducible statistical pattern. Essentially saying that if you analyze them, which is what scientists did, they analyzed it and they came up with these probability densities, these maps, to know where they are. So here is kind of uh, them trying to use that example. If you, you know, and, and you've seen this on TV, right? They put the little box, and then they have the little, where the pitches have been thrown. There's nothing right outside of this, but 70% all the way into, if you were, how likely you will be to be 20% correct. 
So you could construct this map, and this would actually give you an idea about where the electrons are outside of the nucleus around this atom. And that's where we get orbitals. And I want to show the shapes. All right. And I'll go back a little bit. So there are going to be four orbitals. Uh, generally, only three of them are the ones that we focus on in this class. If you get into upper level chemistry, we'll be you'll start talking about the F orbitals. But the S orbitals P, D, and F. They're denoted by letters. These letters represent the quantum mechanical model of electron and where to find them. This spherical volumetric object that you see on these three axes is, is, a, is a ball, it's spherical. That boundary is the outermost point that you can find an electron, and everything that is shown in color is a place that you can find it. So the size of that sphere obviously determines where you can find the electron. Another shape, P. P orbitals look like the kind of like a dumbbell shape, if you will. And there are three orientations, PX, PY, and PZ. The X, Y, and Z tell you what axes the, the dumbbell lays upon. So we only have one orientation for S, we have three for P, D, We have five. And D kind of looks like this cool little flower stuff, except for this last one, which is the dumbbell with this donut around it. We won't have to worry about it. Now, somebody might ask, well, this, this really doesn't make much sense. I don't understand. Once we know where the electron is, then we can kind of say something about how it should behave. The different types of orbitals have to do with different energy levels. But the periodic table will actually show us where these orbitals are. And it's organized as such. So. Uh, This part of the periodic table corresponds with S. The middle part of the periodic table corresponds with D. And the right side of the periodic table corresponds with P. Now, one step further, these orientations have a lot to do with how many elements are in each of these sections. So if we look at S, and I should actually put this in blue, because helium, remember I talked a little bit about why this organization is still a little different. Helium is actually here, but we put it on the noble gases because that takes priority, but helium only has S electrons. P has six total electrons. How do we know that? Well, if we remember, each element is adding an electron. As we move up in atomic number, we move up in electrons for the ground state. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six in P. How many in S? One, two. One, two, all the way down. Here, six, all the way down. D? 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So, if there are five orientations in D, and there's 10 total electrons, then there can only be a total of two electrons in each orientation. Or per orbital, 
as we would call it. What about in P? There's six. We still have two electrons per orbital. And here, two electrons per orbital. I went through all of that to prove this, that electrons like to hang around in pairs. They like to hang around in pairs. So all of these shapes that you're seeing here, 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 and here, are where you can have two electrons. You don't have to have two, but you can. Sometimes you can have one. Sometimes you can have none, right? The hydrogen ion won't have any electrons, H plus. But these are the shapes and the orientation of where you could find them. And I'm not going to get into that. We'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit more with uh, some of the electron configuration after uh, this. I don't want to add this to this example. But again, what you have to remember is that Bohr and Heisenberg, so the Bohr model and the quantum mechanics model, Bohr was first, but it did not work for all the rest of the elements. It had these levels like a ladder. The movement of the electron between the levels corresponded to an energy. That energy corresponded to a wavelength. The emission spectrum showed us that. The quantum mechanical model gives us an idea about shape, probability density. Where can we find the electron? And what energy is associated with that based on these shapes SPD? Now, I want to do uh, maybe two quick examples of these energy calculations. I don't know why they didn't give Planck's constant, but I'm going to pull that up. Which uh, elements did it work for for Bohr? Uh, Bohr model only held true for hydrogen. Okay. As you got into more than one electron, the amount of different combinations of excitement and emission, he couldn't explain all of them. He could explain the, the, the three lines in the hydrogen spectrum because there was only one electron that could ever go anywhere. But once you got up to 10 electrons, we're talking about a, a, a ridiculous amount of different combinations, right? You could go from one to four and down to three. You go one to three, down to one, for each separate electron. Helium has two. Helium has two, and he couldn't explain all of them now neither. But it has one orbital still? It only has one orbital that is considered occupied. Now, the rest of the orbitals still exist. They're just unoccupied. So they can't ever jump? They can. They can. We, we, saw, that in the, we saw that in the spectrum. But they're jumping to places that there are no electrons. In neon, we have multiple energy levels for occupied and we can still see electrons moving between them. That's why Bohr model, it, it, it collapsed right then because they said, okay, well, how can it go to this energy level if you claim that there's something already there? That's where quantum mechanics made a better argument. It said there's this probability density of space so that we don't have to worry about electrons bumping into one another. They're there, but we don't know where. But we know that they're moving between because of the spectrum. Okay, so Planck's constant is what H is. And I'll do some, uh, I'll, I'll organize some, some videos on, on this. This is really straightforward algebra, but the number, I guess I should go back because you can't even see that, is joules, joules seconds, another derived unit. This here is. Uh, the unit all the way expanded. Those that have been in physics might remember that a joule is a distance mass of time. Generally, you see this written as 6.63 sometimes times 10 to the negative 34 joule dot seconds. Remember, when we are talking about derived units, the dot there means that both of these are being multiplied together, the units. Remember, meters over seconds 
means that we are dividing the units. It's a little bit different. So this is the multiplication of a derived unit. This is the division. This is H. All right, C, speed of light is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then, wavelength, lambda, is equal to, you can put whatever in here, all right? This would be generally the, uh, whatever you're measuring, right? These two are constants, always going to be the same. Let's say, I don't know, let's say that you wanted to put in here 1.0 times 10 to the 12 meters. Some huge wavelength, at least some big number. If I wanted to calculate energy using these numbers, then E is equal to HC over lambda, which is equal to 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. I don't know why I didn't finish that, so. Joule seconds times speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, all over 1 times 10 to the 12 meters. Plug, plug that into the calculator. You're going to leave yourself with units of joules. Everything else is canceled. Seconds, gone. Meters, gone. Joules, which is an energy unit, and that will tell us how energetic these, uh, this particular light of this particular wavelength would be. Anybody got a number of that? Seven times ten. So yeah, you could say seven times three, right? You could you could roughly say seven times three, fourteen, twenty-one times ten to the negative twenty-six. One nine nine. So oh, 2 to the what? Negative 37. 2 times 10 to the negative 37 joules. Very small number. Very low energy. And that's what we should expect. Big wavelength. Huge. 1 times 10 to the 12 meter. Small energy. So this is like radio. I think in the radio range, that's how much energy a radio wave has, right? Not very dangerous. Now, if we made that 1 times 10 to the negative 12 meters, then we see a much bigger value uh, for this. Now, um, don't worry about the utilization of new because I actually don't particularly prefer the whole ca calculation using frequency. You just need to be able to plug in a wavelength into this equation and use it. Now, what if I gave you another example and I said 342 nanometers. You cannot plug this directly into here because nanometers will not help you cancel your units. So you're going to have to do, you guessed it, conversion from nanometers to meters. Remember, one nanometer, one times 10 to the what? Negative nine meters. The negative and positive. Those of you all who are still not comfortable, you're going to we're still going to keep doing things and conversions of these units. So this would be 342 times 10 to the negative 9 meters, which needs to be 3.42 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. You can plug this value into the equation. Again, constants, you do not have to remember. They will be a part of your reference material. They are on the reference material for uh, that's on D2L, that's in that packet. All right, any questions? Um, I did update the grades up until I think the pre-lab is the only thing that I haven't done, but I, it's got all the quizzes and all the homeworks up until this point. Um, this quiz, I'll have this grade and put in there. Again, Thursday, uh, go ahead and expect to come in, we're going to have the problem set. Generally, 
I'll um, give an outline of what's going to be on the exam and then give you some time to work on this problem set in class. The expectation is that you don't necessarily go from 1 to 20, however many questions it is. I would say that you should focus on what you don't feel as comfortable with and utilize that time to ask me questions to clarify on your understanding on that. Um, and that's usually how my problem set review day goes. I don't normally walk back through the content. That is where your online resources in here will help you in the YouTubes and things of that nature. Uh, I will be doing some of these on the workout Wednesday as well as some uh, conceptual stuff about Bohr versus quantum mechanics. If there are no questions, then I guess I'll see you all on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Are our labs due today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. The lab is due today. If you have it, let's go ahead and turn that in. Uh, you were, you did get a week to finish that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have to keep up with all of this science in my head. Sometimes stuff gets lost. Thank Okay. I'm not going to just do a bunch of talking about no. I'm going to give a set of problems that's going to cover everything. And then you do the problem and determine. Uh, you can hold on to the periodic table because I need to get some laminate. Yeah. Make sure your name's on any of this uh, last stuff you turn in. I'm going to write my line up on the board. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, that was that was the last one. Yeah, that table, you didn't need that table to, uh, oh, I, it, it was a part of a different page, but I deleted any of the questions that you needed that table. Stay, I know, you and Mr. Jim, hold on to that. No, no. I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. I got to be here. I'm going to be here. And we we'll walk uh, to get this safe to know that still needs to There's a stack for the labs up here up front. No, no, no. We, we should have got a separate room. This, this was based out of the one four, which is... Uh, <laughs>